Hello, this is Sean Murphy, and welcome to the first episode of our Transformers podcast. And with me, we also have... Thomas. What's your last name, Thomas? <laughs> Do I need to put all of my private information out there like that? Uh, my name is Thomas, Thomas Berger. Let's talk about how we first discovered Transformers. Do you want to start? I was born in 85, so Transformers was a thing before I was born, or well, around the time I was born. I never really watched an episode of G1. My introduction to Transformers was Beast Wars. And most of this podcast will be Thomas asking me questions about what is this thing that we're watching? Why is it so bad compared to Beast Wars? <laughs> so say, like, I've always kind of been aware of Transformers. Like I was a kid going to Toys R Us, KB, and I would see like the figures on, on the shelves and stuff. I was like, oh, this is a cool looking robot thing. And I would just leave it at that. I never really thought to think to like, oh, this is really a, a really popular TV series that other people are talking about that I'm just not aware of because my head is buried in NES and SNES RPGs. <laughs> <laughs> well, my experience was I actually had the VHS of episode four and five, which will cover in the future. That's the one where they make the space bridge for the first time and where Starscream's friend from his scientist days shows up. But I also had a children's book with Devastator in it and the the early six issues of the first comic book. So that was my way of getting into Transformers back in the days because I just had all these little little things from it that my parents would get me. Now we've got that out of the way, we're going to begin the review of the episode proper. Thomas, what do you think happened in the first episode? Can you give us a short 20-second plot description based on your memory of all the chaos that happened? Do I have to do word for word? <laughs> apparently, there was a lot of fighting that was happening. There was apparently robot genocide since this is a planet. Cybertron is a planet, and there's only a handful of Autobots left. Uh, they fly, they fight, the Autobots try to escape. Megatron chases them down instead of just killing them because he just wants to see where they're going. Uh, meteors, two meteors collide together for some reason at the same time. And it's just, they're not big, but they shatter into millions and millions of pieces. And the Autobot ship has like a snowplow laser that they're able to carve a path through the asteroid field. Uh yeah, they so, get boarded. All right, so you get you're getting off track now with the summary. So jumping back and forth. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot happened. This is a lot for me to take in for a first episode of just like, oh, okay, this is what this series. All right. All right. So now we're gonna see if Power Master Optimus Prime can describe this uh, plot. Driving to save the world from the evil Decepticons, the heroic Autobots are led by Optimus Prime. He's more than meets the eye. He's a robot in disguise. <laughs> I'm working on a special project for school. What's it about? Brian, just tell me how you and the other Autobots got to Earth. Okay, Tommy. I've handled enough emergencies to know that some things just can't wait. The Transformers first lived on the planet Cybertron. Prime, tell me something I don't know. Well, did you know that centuries of war had drained our planet of its precious energy resources? Whoa, looks like old Cybertron was ready for the scrap heap. Yes, it was. And the Autobots and Decepticons were on the verge of extinction. How did they survive? They scoured the planet for what energy remained. But each side knew that at any moment, a battle could erupt. And that battle could be their last. What do you think of Optimus Prime's description of the War of Cybertron? So <laughs> He's just a big know-it-all. So what you just heard was actually, after Transformers ended, there was a season four that was only three episodes. And then after that, season five came out the next year. It was the entire previous episodes before, only introduced by a live-action Optimus Prime and a child. A child named Tommy? Yeah, a child. Totally wasn't child, a child version of me? <laughs> And he and Optimus just picks him up in his hand and goes, here, let me eat you or hear you better. <laughs> I think eight years or nine years after, I think it was 1992, Generation 2 came out. And once again, they also re-edited the episodes 
with a cube, which basically, if you have ADD, this is what you watch. Because there are transitions every few seconds, but always flipping the camera around, flipping through a cube, and then going through again. And they made this episode in there as well. But the only thing about this episode in G2 is that the, the narrator is different from G1, but he says the exact same script as the original episodes word for word, which is really weird. And also, in the meantime, for the season five ones with the live action Optimus, at least four minutes has to be cut from the episode for all those live action segments. So it's just yeah, like, I what was, do you cut? Like, I, I wasn't obsessive enough to watch both episodes to see what was cut because... You know, by then I'd probably just might as well create a website and track all the differences at that point. Yeah, I haven't seen what you're talking about, but your description of the edits, I assume they probably did it that way so it could fit on like modern TV broadcasting uh, in that time segments and stuff like that. Because at least watching this first episode, these first few episodes, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of filler. Most oh, of yeah. it is plot. I mean, most of it isn't like super important, but it's not like dumb comedy filler. Mm. Kind well, of that's stuff. why there's almost 20 minutes of deleted scenes online for, well, audio anyway. But also one last thing, which shows just how lazy they were in these re-edits is at the very beginning of the G2 episode, when the plot is being described in the beginning, the first 30 seconds, they show clips of Transformers fighting and all they are doing, each different clip is just all taken from the theme song for season five, spliced apart. That's how lazy they were in in doing that. Yeah, so, th this definitely sounds like a lazy kind of thing, especially when you mentioned like the new narrator was just reading the old script of the old narrator. Yeah, they just figured like this is good enough for kids. Where you don't, yeah. we're not gonna waste money writing any new dialogue or anything yeah. like that. But even in the season five episode, the reason like a minute, a whole minute's cut, because Optimus goes in the next episode and repeats the script from the original series. But then there's like 15 seconds of a clip from the next episode. Uh, so it's like why do you, why are you cutting so much of the episode to show what's so, happening in so the, next much of the next episode? For the next segment, well, let's begin with of what you liked and didn't like. I guess one thing to keep in mind about me is I generally like older TV shows, cartoons, <laughs> anime, that kind of thing. I'm really into the 80s stuff and 80s culture, so... As am I. I guess at first going into this, because it's just... I look back on Transformers and think the crowd that likes Transformers is probably... There's a lot of crossover between the crowd that likes G.I. Joe. And I went back and watched some G.I. Joe, and G.I. Joe doesn't really hold up as much to me. But watching this first episode, it definitely, I didn't, I expected to see a bunch of just terrible animation, ter terrible, terrible dialogue, uh, and terrible storytelling. And everything just seemed just fine. I was kind of entertained. Like I mentioned before, there wasn't a whole lot of filler. It was just it's like funny. a lot of good storytelling. But the thing is, I'm thinking, you know, because this is like a three-part episode, intro to the series, we, we got to succeed so we can sell some toys. You got to get them hooked in. Okay. I think that they were really like putting their best foot forward. Don't expect this level of quality to hold up to, throughout the rest of the seasons. It's funny you mention quality because uh, there's a lot of animation errors. I did and if catch you go them, yes. And if you go to the tfwiki.net, they will actually list every single animation error on their website. Like, one, I, I, I only want to talk about ones I personally noticed, not so just taking I'll stuff. I'll just mention one big one that really caught my eye that just made me think that was my source, the source video I'm watching terrible or messed up somehow. In the fight, when the Decepticons boarded the Autobot ship. I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. And... Megatron basically said, just yell, to lead the charge, and told Soundwave to uh, lead the charge and attack the Autobots. He says that a scene plays, but then that same scene, the same five seconds plays a second time with Optimus voice under it. It's yeah. just like... Well, did you also notice the two different sound waves fighting? One sound wave was fighting one Autobot, and then when it cuts away, he's fighting a different Autobot. Oh, so I didn't catch so, that. I did. I was so kind of excited because Soundwave is one of my favorite Transformers, and I was kind of excited that how he led the charge and like he fought three Autobots at once and just threw them all to the ground. I was, I was kind of giddy after that. <laughs> this is related to the animation error. Uh, well, first, the major one I noticed the first is when Bumblebee drives into Jazz in the opening. Mm -hmm. He drives further into where what doesn't exist. He'd be out of his windshield at that point but the main error i saw is so they're in the volcano and it says the volcano erupted four million years later but and then it's, the ship's just there i'm like was a ship sticking out of a mountain for all these years the way the it shows you a mountain and then cuts to it after the four million years i just assumed when i was growing up that the volcano eruption made that part visible even though it wasn't shown so yeah i, I wasn't too sure about that the very first error that i remember seeing watching this was uh starscream he has a his first line of dialogue is in a different voice than what he has through 
throughout the rest of the series. And I thought that was, I definitely caught that because Starscream's voice is iconic to me. I immediately, I was like, okay, that's wrong. It's the first episode. We're in the first three minutes. Maybe, maybe they just didn't figure it out selling the things just yet. So what are your thoughts on the most useless Decepticon ever, Reflector? Three guys that need the effort to turn into one camera that can print a picture of said uh, image that they see. I mean, I wasn't, uh, okay. Well, first you got to give him credit, more credit than what you give him. He isn't just a camera. He's a camera with a built-in printer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a thing that I was kind of confused about. I saw the three guys. I was like, oh, okay. Is his, his name's reflector? Maybe he's reflecting three images or maybe it really is. It's three Autobots that just, we're three uh, Decepticons real actually that can just make this camera. I was like, oh, okay. Uh I was like, can he not see through his own lens? And, and then tell at first, him? I was like, oh, so I guess maybe he's just one of one of the Transformers that Soundway harbors, but it seems like he's his own guy, which was like, I had questions. I definitely had questions about that. <laughs> yeah, even as a kid, I knew this this Transformer was was pretty worthless. I'm just like, who wants to use this guy in their battles? That's the toy that you always see on the shelf. Everything else is sold out, but here's Reflector. <laughs> And what's funny is, like, he can't use his own power like Ravage or anyone else can. Mm -hmm. Well, like, he can't just say, hey, I see this. He has to, like, stay there and print it out. He can't just turn back and be like, we saw this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they have the power to, like, you know, create hologram pro projections and stuff like that. At least some of the Transformers do. You would think that, you know, this guy is all about imaging. Why wouldn't he get that technology or even build it himself with all the scientists around him? He has to be picked up by another Transformer so I can see what you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> There's one point in the show where Optimus Prime basically does the roll call mm -hmm. and does all the Transformers, and it was nearly perfect except for one thing. Mirage is sitting there and he doesn't call his name. If you're just watching this for the first time, you're going to think, which of those two did he just call? And then another one it is not there, it's two Autobots, and he calls Mirage's name and the two there. So you're like, they, they had it almost perfect except for one error between the audio and the visual to help people determine who was who. But uh, uh, yeah, one... I guess that part did kind of seem off to me. The first part where he was calling for Mirage or that he showed up, was he one of the earlier Autobots in the roll call? Yeah, no, they were just, uh, he was one of the main like eight in the first roll call. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, because the first roll call seemed odd because it seemed like he was reading names, but then only one of the robots responded in the first scene. I, I yeah, it was just confusing because the timing was just, just wasn't right. So what do you think of, at the beginning descriptor, it says the evil Decepticons and the peace-loving Autobots. What do you think of uh, peace-loving to describe anybody? Well, my main issue was with them calling the Decepticons evil because having, I guess, my understanding of the history of Transformers is that all Transformers were just Transformers. There really wasn't, well, I guess there might've been factions. I don't, I'm not too sure, but Decepticons weren't innately evil. They weren't always evil. It was just more just a dispute and they took sides and then you know you're probably thinking of the comic book plots that i've shown you or had you read sometimes okay so where they're not always evil in the beginning okay that, that might because be the case this but... is the 1980s when it was only good versus evil and there okay. was no room so for that's gray. what i wanted to know if they we were inventing the lore you have this is what it all began with like the Decepticons was, are evil. And like, okay, it was like, I, okay, if this is what, this is the lore. I mean, this is the ground, the foundation of Transformers, everything. I can, I can live with that. But then I still had the question, okay, if they're evil because they're killing off all these Autobots and people who dis they're in disputes with, I, I mean, a lot of Autobots are doing the same kind of thing. They, they're, I feel like they're just as did responsible you, for killing you, off all these Transformers where there's only like a, a few dozens on both sides, just like complete Transformer genocide with this planet. <laughs> yeah. What did you not get from Megatron's dialogue in these three episodes, just how evil he is? He's like, I'm going to rule everything. The world, Cybertron I mean, is mine. Well, I'm sure that we will get through it, but uh, there's some bloodthirsty Transformers on the Autobot side. <laughs> I can think of two right now that would not be... I Are you talking about when Ironhide takes out his big-ass gun and tries to assassinate Megatron the first thing they do when they wake up? That wasn't Ironhide. That was Clip Jumper. No, it was Ironhide. Ironhide flew off after them, and somebody flew off with them. But then Hound and Clip Jumper were together, and Clip Jumper just kept talking about... Let's see. I think I actually had the quote. It was... I thought it was uh, Cliff... Yeah, it was Cliff Jumper then... And that Hound, was firing. Hound with the Jeep. Yeah, Cliff Jumper mm -hmm. was firing. He, was, he said, I got him dead in my sight. And, and he, he says that line immediately after that. He shoots and misses <laughs> completely. It almost kills Starscream in the, in the back. 
But right before that, he wanted to go off and fight. And, and, and like, Hound was like, cool your jets. Optimus told us this is basically, like, do recon. And yeah. he's just like, why does this guy want to go fight? Off, go off and fight 30 hey. Decepticons by himself. Hey, it's war. He's determined. <laughs> he's been at this so long. He's he been at this so long. He's this guy. He's this guy revenge. He, the Decepticons killed one of his buddies. They killed his family. They killed his dog. <laughs> his robo dog. <laughs> his robo dog. So... I want to ask you something. One uh, segment that I wanted to mention is that it won't happen now. Is, is did anyone in this episode feel like a main character? Hey boys, we're gonna be movie stars. I don't think anyone did in this first episode. But what about you? Did you think anything? No, I don't think anybody was really a main character. Primary characters in this episode, if we had to point to any, would be Optimus Megatron, Starscream, mm, Sound Maybe Waves. Maybe Sound Wave. Yeah, he did he everything. Utilized pretty much in everything. Yeah. I mean, it's hard with the Autobots. There's not really a second in command of the Autobots. It's always just whoever Optimus Prime feels like issuing orders to. Whereas, yeah. uh... well, I, there are. The, you, I, there, I guess there really wasn't shown a second in command, but there were based on their responsibilities. She would feel like Jazz would be higher up in echelon because just because he was the pilot but he was only the pilot for about half a second before he jumped or somehow flew out of his seat in the just the weirdest animation oh, when yeah. the asteroids hit i couldn't believe what i was seeing nope. but then immediately optimus just takes over he's he's doing he is carrying the autobots by himself he's <laughs> doing everything everybody else is just they're just hanging on for the ride they're definitely they definitely aren't soldiers there <laughs> further on in an episode there was one question i had about the humans and just their reaction upon seeing the giant robots kind of questionable as soon as the the decepticons see the humans and they land on their old platform or wherever they were doing construction or whatever their first reaction is to yell aliens and throw rocks right. at them yeah the, the first part you see an alien you'll be like you, you're with your buddy is like oh my god look at that i've never seen that before is that an alien yeah, aliens. That's a good word to utter. Immediately after that, you attack them. These towering metal beasts. You want to just start a war with all these dudes with giant guns. The gun's bigger <laughs> than you, by the way. And all you have is tools and nuts and bolts and rocks. Why? Why would you go and say you just immediately just want to attack these guys? That is not... Oh, man. The humans... <laughs> <laughs> that is not the thing to do. Yeah. But yeah, that's about that's about it as far as... Uh, okay. Well, I guess maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it with Starscream. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess as people will get to know me, Starscream is my favorite Transformer. And I think he should be the leader of the Decepticons. I think he is completely capable of leading the Decepticons. The narrator says that this war had been going on for eons. If Starstream was the general of the Decepticons, the war would have been over. Well, how do you not know? One way or another. He might have lost it immediately, <laughs> or he might have won immediately. The decision that Megatron made to just, instead of just bombing the, the Autobots, where they know exactly where they're, they're holed up, they have Soundwave outside spying on them the whole time not being spotted they could have just went and crushed the autobots right then but instead of just going and killed them like starscream insisted megatron do he decided no we're just gonna follow these guys to where they're going the war could have been over well the see well you forget that they don't have any energy left so megatron is hoping to have them lead them to the energy and then he'll steal the energy from them so that they'll be more in power because they'll have more energy than to rely on this still seems kind of weird to me but if it weren't for those asteroids starscream i really feel like he really should be the leader. I well, mean, speaking of there's Starscream, there's so many instances where like things, I feel like things could have been dealt with, but Megatron just is like, I don't know, he just has this obsession with the chase. Well, speaking of Starscream, I have a segment. It's called Starscream's Blunders. The question is basically, what did Starscream do this episode that helped the Autobots? Nothing at all. <laughs> so you're forgetting Starscream. He's the best Decepticon ever. He shot at the Ark which caused the restoration beam to start healing the Autobots, therefore preventing total Decepticon victory. What do you say to that, Thomas? Um, <laughs> Starscream is great. <laughs> but then again, Megatron also just left them there instead of making sure they were dead. Yeah. So, so they both are at fault at this instance. Well, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, I saw that. At first it was kind of odd where the Autobot ship just just healed and started repairing anybody the first person he the robot 
the the AI tried to uh, well, did it's repair. mentioned in the books and the comic books, um, but not in this animation. Apparently, it's uh, it's stated specifically that the controls were so destroyed it couldn't determine friend from foe, so it just started healing all of yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, since the crash, it was four million years since the crash, so. Mm-hmm. Not four. Was it four million or four hundred? Four million. Four million years Mm -hmm. since the crash. So yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, this is definitely happening, probably because AI corrupted all these millions of years or something like that. It was just kind of funny that their ship just turned on them and started healing Decepticons, (laughs) and the Decepticons just they just left they just didn't look any for resources any files they didn't yeah. execute and oh, make sure we'll that get back they... to that in the third episode but yeah it was kind of but i still thought that starscream was doing the right thing it was like okay yeah we can go finish this off but let's make sure that nobody but we're not doing is capable. this segment is not what he <laughs> intended on doing it's what happened i'm protesting this segment <laughs> the name of this segment but yeah i was riding high on that wave and just like yeah you tell him starscream that's exactly what needs to be done but then yeah he kind of just made things completely worse and but he but if it weren't for starscream we wouldn't have a tv series that's right so so there are two more really stupid things i wanted to mention one is optimus survives falling in the third episode from from the entrance of space all the way to the ground and he's fine but iron trips and falls over and immediately starts leaking oil when the asteroids hit (laughs) he's like oh my oil tank (laughs) oh yeah i do remember that i didn't put that together yeah just just so much like i said it's just it's just optimus he's the only capable one well it's like either ironhide is really old back when metal was made differently because they always reference that ironhide is like the old one of the oldest people there or he just fell on a really sharp corner on his way down (laughs) or it's just it's just whatever the writers feel like hurts some hurts someone this time is what hurts them that's pretty much what you'll have to expect during this series sometimes someone will explode and survive other times they'll take a, a dart to the hand and be immobilized yeah take a blaster bolt to the chest oh they they survived this time but oh this is the episode where they need to die so this one shot that they survive all these other episodes this is the one that kills them <laughs> yeah well like how is this is spoilers but how is like megatron boarding the ship any different than when he boarded the ship in the movie and then when everybody just dies left and right yeah. Yeah. in that one megatron only needed you know 10 more years to get better at killing people instead of the four million yeah, he had I was gonna previously say, they, they've had practice apparently <laughs> well the other the other thing i i thought was stupid was megatron says he wants to know what optimus is doing in space when starscream questions why doesn't he blow up i'm like but you already know laser beak's message told you that they were going to find a new energy source and you said to follow them not one minute ago <laughs> so you already <laughs> forgot what you commanded everyone to do and your own it's just an error that makes megatron be like have memory loss all of a sudden <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah. It, so many. Yeah, I just kind of, just kind of had to just keep going along with the ride. Just like, okay, yeah, all right. We're not going to think about that anymore. One thing I wanted to show you, which is really interesting, is on YouTube about two years ago, someone put up all the deleted audio from every episode of Transformers. They must be terminated. Like I think the official hasbro sites or someone who worked there uh put it on youtube so there's deleted audio from every single episode of generation one out there that's cool i was going to show anytime something that seemed like a completely deleted scene i was going to show because there's actually 20 to 25 minutes of audio deleted audio for the first episode but i thought there were only four worth showing or mentioning right now okay so, yeah that makes sense watching this episode so there was like one or two parts where i was just kind of confused what's the time frame with this like how did this happen so soon i guess when they were leaving cybertron and they got into space it only seemed about a few minutes that they were in space that they well, encountered the asteroid and that they were falling to earth it just all seems to happen so quickly like well, in a span of a few minutes well this is a deleted scene for you it's an extended star scream audio my time will come, Megatron. Never. Never! You are destined to be a follower, Starscream. That's that's just for you. A delete cut audio of him saying that you're only a servant. Ah, oh, man. When that happened, the only a servant part, I didn't... I did, That was obviously deleted from the episode, but your time will come. Never, never. I was at, I was angry, but was so happy at the same time because that was just such a good line delivered by Megatron. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, it just made me laugh so much. He <laughs> just like never, never. But I, and as you're watching it, Starscream turns his back to Megatron. He, Starscream just has like a sad, dejected look <laughs> on his face. It's like, ah, oh, I'm gonna be the leader. Stop telling me this. <laughs> I, I don't think I noticed that. It was yeah, it was just so great. But that, this is that okay, whole encounter. This is a little different because this is almost a full minute long deleted scene because there's tons of cut audio mixed with all the other audio when they're on the ship. Some of it is. Uh, then mentioning about how the war destroyed their planet and just like a lot of character stuff that was left out. I don't care how you do it. I may be getting old, Mirage, but I'd rather be back on Cybertron where the action is. All these flashing lights make my pistons sputter. <sighs> Me too, Ironhide. But not to fight. I remember what it was like before the war. Everything was so... so beautiful. I know how you feel, Mirage, but if we don't fight, we won't have a home to go back to. Prime, I think we're being followed. Release a few tracks. Autobots inside Megatron. Excellent. Execute cover phase. We don't want the Autobots to see us. Not yet. Megatron, why don't we just blast them into a pile of nuts and bolts and be done with it? You're off your flight path, Starscream, as usual. If Optimus Prime knows of an energy source, let him lead us to it. Cover phase complete. That's strange. Whatever it was just disappeared. I don't like it. Maybe it's hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, uh, that's uh, two lines. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting because there was more dialogue with Starscream and Megatron, and Mirage will end up being the main character of the third episode. There was this dialogue with him lamenting about how beautiful Cybertron was to show how he hates the war, but almost half of his character development through all this first three episodes, it was just on the cutting room floor, which is why which is really weird considering how that's what they were working towards the three episodes. I've got some other deleted scenes here which are hilarious and they're all Starscream. Convert the area for- Whoop. All right, you ready for it? I have to brace myself. This is probably going to be mocking Starscream. These things are heavy thundercracker. Why do we have to carry them? Yeah, I can't wait till the other bunch are our slaves so they can do all the work. Skywarp! How dare you question the task? Well, we just thought that, that, that you are not to think. You are to do. We're sorry, Megatron. We... Silence! It, it won't happen again. I don't think it will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. That was just, like, it's a whole scene cut that's really hilarious. Um, so the other scene, the last scene, I think needs context. I can't remember if it's this one or another. There's a, actually a cut scene in the storyboards where Thundercracker and Starscream, Thundercracker crips up what looks like a giant frisbee and tosses it at Starscream, and they start playing around instead of working. And Megatron oh. immediately blasts it when it's being tossed back to Starscream and says, "Get to work." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I have to. And I guess, is there any, like, this is just deleted audio. They never animated that. Yeah, they never animated oh, this audio. Man. But this, this is a segment I like to call Teenage Starscream. This is no time for games, Starscream. Get to work like all the others. Don't tell me what to do. I'm not like the others. I do what I want when I want. No, Starscream. As long as I am the leader of the Decepticons, you will do exactly as I tell you. Wow, that voice for Megatron was really good at the end there. Yeah. But I'm I'm sorry to uh, show you even more of Starscream, Starscream being a whiny teenager. He's gonna go stomp off to his room. <laughs> <laughs> So that was some cool deleted scenes. Normally the next episode uh, segment won't begin until episode four. It's called Retcons This Episode. <laughs> so was there anything in this episode that contradicted episodes that came before it? Well, this is more of a misplaced animation error, where it's like the Autobots were like, let's go find the Decepticons. And it's only after that scene does Megatron say, now we're going to go attack something. So I was like, well, how did you know where to go when they weren't attacking anything yet? Yeah. I, yeah, I didn't really notice anything huge like that. Uh... I guess for me, finally, well, I guess get, for me, watching these episodes for the first time and getting like an actual foundation for all of the terms and lore that I've learned mm -hmm. from other series, 
I thought Energon was always just Energon. Why would that? It was just like basically like a fossil fuel that you pulled out of the ground. I didn't know it was basically Energon cubes are basically a container that you put energy in. Well, what it is is it's turning the energy into Cybertronian energy. So like they'll take the oil or the electricity and they'll convert it into their form of energy called Energon. I, I like I particularly like the scene. I don't know if it's in this episode where they make an Energon cube and then they flatten it. <laughs> yeah. So that whole I that whole segment was blowing my mind because one. The Energon Cube was dispensed from Soundwave's chest. Beast Wars is like where I learned a lot of that stuff. And yeah, it was just like, oh, Energon is just this material that's just in the ground that they find. That's why I thought that they ran out of energy because they digged up, they mined all the resources out of Cybertron. Yeah, yeah but in Cybertron, their source of energy is Energon. So when they go to other planets, they have to convert it to Energon. Yeah, so that's I. So basically, yeah, Energon Cubes are basically just containers well no, they're not basically containers yet <laughs> so, like you said that they convert it and then you know when so, they're in the cube with the, with the blue light mix and stuff yeah, yeah. And that's just what, imagining being like if sound waves was a human that's like the equivalent of going here i produce plastic <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah that whole thing i couldn't that was blowing my mind at, at that and um, then, uh, the only thing i thought was funny is uh spike is 14 years old he is working on an oil rig so according to the fair labor standards act you cannot be in a job that impedes your education. So <laughs> he should not be working there, and his father should be fined or his child separated from him. Well, what is the level of education that's required in this world? Well, it's world? also his, your health cannot be impacted at that age as well. And, of course, your health is impacted on an oil rig. All right, all right. So maybe that makes sense. Uh-huh. I guess one thing that's odd, just thinking back, so watching some of the other Transformers series and episodes, then finally coming back and watching this, there's a lot of melee combat, like hand-to-hand combat in yeah. these episodes. I thought it was just going to be all like, you know, old cartoons like G.I. Joe and stuff where it's just like, here's blue and red laser bolts f- shooting b- back side to side. No, I feel like the majority of the combat between the two sides, they were fighting hand-to-hand. Like when they, when they Decepticons first boarded the ship, it's Soundwave just ta- getting tackled by three Autobots and he's just wrestling with them and throwing them down. I watched the scene of... Starscream and Thundercracker pick up an Autobot and throw him off the side of a railing. He grabbed the railing, got back up, and did a drop kick on on the on the two of them when they were trying to fight another guy. And then there's Optimus and Megatron. They're they're fighting each other. But yeah, I was just surprised at just the level of melee combat, which I think is more is, is funny. I like that much better. Just watching them fight instead of just here's us shooting, missing constantly. Oh uh, yeah, because yeah, and it makes sense because a punch isn't gonna kill most yeah. most raw. Uh, you're not shot by a laser. Yeah. That's like oh the stun effect laser. Yeah, but then oh this time the laser kills you when you need it. So I actually thought that was a lot. Well, cooler. in Transformers, all the lasers are always actually injuring you. They just don't have like full power, I guess, because every time they hit, they're like oh crap, I got injured. Everyone's getting injured on this show. Yeah, there was uh, I was surprised like laser beak was basically taking on Cliff Jumper and Hound when they were spotted. They yeah. sent Laserbeak after, and I was like, why are you going to send oh, yeah. this, this spy? And, but and, Laserbeak basically chased them both down, and he, he basically took them one by himself and won. Yeah. Because yeah. I guess he was, was one, I didn't know, because it's already weird that Laserbeak is a Transformer that lives inside of Soundwave. But apparently, Laserbeak himself can break off pieces of himself. He ch- oh, see, the I thought there was an transform- animation error. I thought Megatron's gun was substituted for Laserbeak and started firing at them. No, it was one of Laserbeak's guns that he oh, dismounted okay. from himself and made just float in the air. It didn't have any kind of jet engine or thrust well, guess animation. What? It, he made it just chase after... Uh... That will never happen again this entire series. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> no wonder that seemed kind of odd. It didn't make any sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things that happen once. For instance, this segues into the character segment later, but Starscream has a null ray. In the very first episode, he uses it and actually freezes something that makes it ice. Well, as you'll see in every single episode after, the null ray actually paralyzes people. It paralyzes Transformers so they can't move, and essentially freezing them in place. Mm-hmm. So I think either someone misinterpreted what someone was talking about, or there was a translation error for the animators and they accidentally applied that to being frozen because in all of their future episodes, whenever he shoots someone with it, it's paralyzed. Or when he shoots the generators, they just stop working because that's what the null ray does. It stops electronics from working. And there's also the more cynical view where they just didn't want to animate or draw, you know, frozen objects. They could save money by just letting the, the cell just sit there <laughs> instead uh, of drawing over it. 
Yeah. Uh, I guess one other thing that I seem I didn't think that any Transformer could do was teleport. Where Mirage, it seems like he has that ability. He can teleport with his holograms or whatever. When a Mirage doesn't teleport, he turns invisible and then just walks around somewhere. While you're oh, looking. is that what he... Okay, well then that makes yeah. sense. But there's a Decepticon that can teleport. When Ironhide was chasing after... That's episode the... two. Oh, so was? save that for episode two. Uh, all right. I got it. Don't worry. anyway. <laughs> but do you want to get into the character segment? Yep, let's go right in. Okay, so every episode we're going to go through one of the, I think, 16 or 18 characters from G1. And we're going to we're gonna do their toy quote as well as their personality description and see if it matches what actually happened in the cartoon. <laughs> so the first thing we have is Starscream. Yes. A little bit of backstory. He transforms into a jet. Yep. So Starscream, his original name was Alktar. Alktar. Yes. A- according to the toy? Yep. And went, no, we uh, turned into all the notes until they hired Bob Budiansky. I hope I pronounced his name right. And he changed his name to Starscream. Though along the way, two other names were implemented. The nickname for him was Pretty Poison by Bob when he first got hired. Pretty and, Poison. And one of the Transformers magazines a few times called him the Silver Snake. <laughs> so eventually, for whatever reason, he was eventually called Starscream. But, okay, so here's the quote. From his original toy, conquest is made of the ashes of one's enemies. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, that's a great quote. His description is, seeks to replace Megatron as leader, ruthless, cold-blooded, cruel, dot, dot, dot. Considers himself the most sophisticated and handsome of Decepticons. <laughs> he is the coolest one. He believes Decepticons should rely more on guile and speed rather than brute force to defeat Autobots. The fastest flyer of the group, he can reach Mach 2.8, and an altitude of 52 miles. Shoots cluster bombs and null rays, which disfl- disrupt the flow of electricity. See, right there is what it actually says. Very good at what he does, but sometimes overrates himself. <laughs> uh. I really don't appreciate how, like, the first line in his description is just about how he wants to turn on Megatron to lead the Decepticons. So that's, why does that have to be the first thing he's known for? <laughs> okay, so for, for the first, uh, you said he's your favorite character. He so is. what makes him your favorite character? He's I like him because he just has more depth than most, most of the characters. And he has more depth in an interesting way because he's not the only one that has like depth. But yeah, I like him because one, I like his design. But then two, <laughs> it's just like the scenarios and his dialogue and his quotes and his ambition. I just love it so much. Because he does have, I, I, Megatron, I, I honestly believe that he just, Megatron makes dumb mistakes and choices and stuff like that. And I do feel that one way or another, Starscream could have things settled. I never really liked Starscream when I was growing up. Even though I had the Starscream figure, mm-hmm. I, like mostly it was all He-Man, so he would just be with my He-Man stuff. But I just thought, I always liked how, how his design looked, even if I didn't necessarily like his character. Mm-hmm. But one of the things... Well, I mean... And I guess we're, we're not, well, yeah, we're kind of from the same generation. And I feel like around this time, there's a mo- there was a movie called Top Gear. Uh, not Top Gear. Top Gun? <laughs> Top Gun. <laughs> okay. There's a video game called Top Gear. Uh, there's a movie called Top Gun. You mean Metal Gear? Uh, no, not Metal Gear. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed like, you no, know, just military imagery was just like a thing that was in the <laughs> culture where just here's a poster of an F-16. Just, <sighs> yeah, that You're, was a thing. You no, know, one thing my grandparents bought me. A lot when mm-hmm. I was with them. Uh, my grandfather was in World War II. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up in elementary school, he used to buy me Desert Storm trading cards. Yes. Yeah, and like... these had pictures of every military aircraft, tank. And what's weird is they would even have victories. Like, we won the victory of this in, mm-hmm. in Baghdad or whatever. I might have been completely wrong with that. Yeah. But, yeah, it was just like, I used to collect these. They made five different card series of this. Six if you count the blue ribbon set, which I have, <laughs> which is the only set I have complete. So I was a kid that was into those uh Yeah, I was the things. same way. Like, I would play the, the different helicopter games that, they would, that Electronic Arts would make for... No Sega, PC, just all these plain stuff. Jets were just cool. So, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't surprising to me to see that a lot of the of the Decepticons just were, of the, they were designed as jets. They're designed as jets. I like jets. They just have a cool design. The, the coloring on Starscream, I like the best uh, well, of the is, flyers. <laughs> well, this is a little more about character. Uh, so I told you I had two VHS tapes growing up with Transformers. Mm-hmm. The second one I had, you learn that Starscream was actually a scientist on Cybertron before he became a Decepticon, mm-hmm. and he joined because he really liked the fact that he could have power and, and prestige and stuff like this, and turn and uh, decided to join them. However, they come across this this guy who's his old ex scientist, 
has no idea about the war because he was like frozen before the war happened and so he's trying to make him be his friend again but as the decepticons mm -hmm. so it's almost like starscream's friend and he's trying to get him to join the decepticons whereas he's conflicted and i was like that was the only time that i thought like starscream was interesting because even though he was manipulating his friend he was actually wanted him to be with them because it was his friend yeah it actually does sound kind of cool is, is this going to happen in g1 yeah, yeah this is like the eighth episode all right yeah i'm looking forward to that yeah so hopefully not too many spoilers for you but then again i tell you stuff all the time which <laughs> makes you want to read them or watch them in the first place well and half the time i forget i just have terrible memory <laughs> <laughs> the la the one segment i want to do about the characters is what was their fate after the transformers movie wait i still function uh, do we have to talk about this <laughs> so starscream was killed by Galvatron. Oh, why? <laughs> but he was apparently so popular that he became a ghost capable of possessing yes. people. However, How dare he eventually gets a new body, is caught in an explosion that drifts through space without enough energon to get back. He eventually dies, becomes a ghost again, falls into a time portal, goes back to Earth, where he can possess people again during the Beast Wars cartoon. But he never returns to the present because there's actually a Japanese manga where he teams up with his old past Starscream self to try to take over the Megatron together. Okay, so And this, that's his last appearance. So this was in a Japanese series. When did this Japanese series take place in the continuity? Did it take place after Beast Wars where he gets... Well, well no, it... Uh, well, yeah, it takes place after Beast Wars. Because after Beast Wars, his mind or his soul, whatever, or spark... It's apparently drifted for millions more years until it caught up to the present again. Oh. Okay. And then was able to team up with his past self... And, try, and I'm just like, that's crazy. I got to read that soon. Yeah, I probably have to refresh myself on that because I thought it was stuck in uh, Waspinator for forever. But I guess it might, it, Waspinator might have got his mind. I'd have to, but yeah, it's like, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Japanese manga. There are 10 manga series that take place between season two and the movie. Wow. And, that's a lot of Transformers. Well, actually nine, uh, actually nine or eight because one of them is actually the third season in comic form that's not the same thing but yeah there's a lot of manga that came out in the late 90s early 2000s where they just kept telling more g1 stories mm -hmm. since this was years after they just started writing whatever they felt like but yeah that was his fate and then i who knows what's going to happen maybe there'll be a third maybe he'll eventually watch himself get killed go back in time and then finally take over back <laughs> in the present and you know be back there again but yeah no his fate is just undetermined because he doesn't get involved in anything after that okay some of the stuff that uh, occurred, series that occurred after Beast Wars, Prime, Armada, Armada Energon. Did Those he... are different universes. Oh, okay. This is the G1 universe. All right. Beast okay. Wars is actually part of this Generation 1 continuity. Okay. So, what, so I guess when does Beast Wars actually take place? Well, it takes place in the past, but so character-wise, so it's... it's characters that are a few million years after this series has ended going back into the past from before when the Transformers woke up. Okay, so yeah, because that was what kind of confused me. Because again, my first exposure was where I really just sat down was watching Beast Wars. So what you must have been confused when you watched season two, and they were like, "Hey, here's this arc with this other guy named Megatron and this other guy named Optimus on it." Well, I, yeah, I was confused, and then I watched this episode, and I was still confused. <laughs> and I just, because, but I guess it was kind of easy to get over because I there's just so many different continuities of and universes with Transformers. I just felt like they were all kind of just their own thing hmm. but yeah watching this episode where they, like they crash and then it's four million years later it was like it, it seemed like beast wars was kind of taking place back in prehistoric times with early man and dinosaurs and stuff like that so this is like are these supposed to take place but then like you said the old transformers the old original Optimus, they show up oh are, all right did. But you didn't know G1 existed when that happened, right? When you I knew it, it existed. I okay. didn't know its time frame. Okay. So well, that's why I was confused because I assumed G1 was like, yeah, modern day. And from watching the first episode, yeah, it is so basically you, modern day. So how did you get interested in Starscream when you didn't know, when you didn't really watch G1? Like I said, I, I knew of the show. I never watched it, okay. but I always saw the toys around and stuff like that. So I would see the toys on the shelves, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's a cool figure and stuff like that. So, yeah. And then when you eventually watched them, you're like, man, I love this guy. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, well, that's it for our very first episode. Uh, we hope you'll continue to join us for our second episode, where we will look at the second episode of, <laughs> of The Transformers. Thanks for listening. Thanks to tfraw.blogspot.com for the Season 5 and Generation 2 episodes.
Thanks for YouTube user Transformers at the Moon for hosting every deleted audio segment from every episode of the Transformers. Thanks to tfwiki.net for information used in our character spotlight feature.